Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Jim, for that nice introduction. And thank you to the organizers of this conference for inviting me to share about CARE. Um, just to give you an outline of what I'm going to cover today, I'm going to talk about some of the demographic um, issues, some of the critical issues around aging in Singapore, and I think that they will apply to other Asian countries that are rapidly aging. Um, these include healthy life expectancy, and I thank you for Saito for providing such a nice uh, background introduction to healthy life expectancy, so I won't have to go over that myself. Uh, Long-term care use and caregiver burden, social isolation, and then um, issues surrounding work, retirement, and cognition. Uh, I'll then go into why CARE was established with support from the Singapore Ministry of Health and what our mandate is, and give you two examples of research projects, and then talk a little bit about international partnerships and where, where we see um, data sharing possibilities. So Singapore is rapidly aging. Um, by the year 2030, we expect about 24% of our population to be over the age of 65. And in, um, in tandem with this uh, population aging, the whole social structure fabric of society is also changing. Uh, declining fertility rates, our fertility rate is about 1.19 now. Um, declining, uh, well, ri rising non-marriage rates, uh, rising uh, divorce rates and issues of migration where older adults are sometimes left on their own um, to fend for themselves when adult children are overseas. So just to put it in a little bit of um, context in Asia, um, Singapore is um, this blue line here and Korea is the yellow line and Japan is, is the orange line which obviously Japan is the oldest population but you can see that um, South Korea and Singapore are really going to be catching up to Japan around 2045 or so. And so our rate of population aging is extremely accelerated, which has issues for policymakers and for practitioners. And it, part of my job this morning, I think, is to kind of um, link the research and policy issues together and um, provide you with some examples of how evidence provided by data can inform public policy. Before I move on, I just want to highlight this is the proportion of the population aged 80 and over, and it's the fastest growing um, proportion of um, the populations worldwide. And given this increase in, this rapid increase in the proportion aged 80 and over, um, this um, brings in issues of extended periods of caregiving, and um, dementia. I think our dementia rates in Singapore are going to quadruple um, by 2030 from what they are now. That has a lot of implications for caregiving. So some of the demographic trends that I mentioned earlier, the, the lower rates of marriage and lower fertility rates, really mean that families are, are shrinking and that there are fewer family members to provide support, even if they would really, really want to provide support. Sometimes there's just not enough <clears throat> hands. Um, the extended period of longevity is also correlated with uh, sandwich generation phenomena where you have um, middle-aged couples looking after young or teenage children of their own and um, their older parents. And this uh, sandwich generation group is, is growing. And as I mentioned earlier, increases in longevity mean a longer period of caregiving, which has financial and social implications. So in the newspapers, in Singapore at least, um, there's been an increased dialogue in forum pages, in articles that the um, um, news correspondents are focusing on, on the burden of chronic disease. And I won't talk too much about that today, but non-communicable diseases obviously are, are the diseases of the next century. Um, caregiving is also an uh, important issue that, uh, particularly in the sandwich generation, how can they find work-life balance so that they can provide care, or how can they financially um, be helped to, to provide care? Long-term care is another issue. There's a lot of conversation. Um, should we be building more nursing homes, or should we be still sticking to our 
traditional idea that family is the main caregiver of older adults. Um, so that segues into the next bullet point, which is what is the role of the family versus the state in providing care. And finally, um, building a sustainable health system. Um, this is David Matcher's um, expertise, actually. But moving from a, a health system that was historically based in uh, acute care, uh, focused on acute care, this is in Singapore when Singapore was young, um, to a health system where the focus really needs to be on primary care when you're talking about a population where a quarter of the population is above the age of 65. So how do you move um, the health system from an acute-based one to a, one that's centered around primary care? And so policymakers in Singapore have identified these few areas as priority areas uh, for the country over the next five years to maximize family care, so they're still um, insisting that families should be the first line of support, first line of defense. Um, promote aging in place. There's a lot of effort um, by the Singapore government to redesign urban communities so that older adults can age in place and bring in health services uh, for them. So strengthening community-based health care is a major, major thrust right now. Um, minimizing hospitalizations and institutionalization. So uh, researchers um, that are interested in this area are actually um, get, getting a lot of traction, uh, i.e. some research funding, to look at how to reduce uh, frequent readmissions, for example, and to improve uh, provision and quality of long-term care services. Just last year, we, we passed for the National um, Home Care Association's quality standards, whereas before, prior to, to last year, they weren't available for the country. But all of this work, all of this policy making really needs evidence. And I think for us in the room, we're interested in providing that evidence and having policymakers listen to us. So <clears throat> the Ministry of Health um, decided in January of this year to start a Center for Aging Research and Education in partnership with the Duke NUS Graduate Medical School. And um, this is CARE, and I will talk a little bit about care, what CARE is supposed to be doing, and then two examples of research that CARE has undertaken, and, where, and then where we're going to go next. So the vision of CARE is to achieve health, social inclusion, and a high quality of life for older Singaporeans. How are we going to do that? Um, well, in the first place, by providing an environment that enables multidisciplinary research and education on aging. Um, we're going to try and implement and evaluate best practices to improve health and function of older adults and inform the national policy agenda on aging. So that's what we were set up for. If you look at this diagram, you'll see that the progression from being well um, to pre-frail includes a decline in resilience. Um, to frail, which um, includes functional disability, as um, Saito was explaining, difficulty with ADLs, and then to dead. Um, what the research we want to focus on should include is how to delay progression across these states and how to improve resilience, that is, the ability to recover from stressors and this includes social psychological resilience um, as well as physical resilience. So this gives you a very broad overview of the type of research we're trying to do. Obviously, within each, each box, determinants of well-being would be a topic in and of itself, or, or trying to um, estimate predictors of pre-frailty would be a whole topic in and of itself. But this is supposed to just give you an overview of, of um, the different um, subgroups that we're looking at in the population. So care is unique because it's supposed to bridge the social and the medical. For the medical school, I think it's the first time that, that they've um, invested in having social scientists work together with clinicians. So this is the chance that we have. Um, and I think it's partly in recognition that aging is not just a medical problem. It has many, many social 
um, components to it. And without understanding aging holistically, our attempts at um, um, remedies are going to be, you know, pretty much shots in the dark and may not be as effective as, as we like. So the center has a few research themes that we wanted to start out with, and these include healthy aging, uh, visual impairment, uh, neurocognitive disorders. These bullet points two and three are linked to particular programs within the Duke NUS Graduate Medical School. There's a focus on eye and a focus on um, neurocognitive disorders. Um, then we wanted to focus on retirement transition and look at health and well-being prior to retirement and, and um, after retirement. We're also interested in long-term care, predictors of utilization primarily, both from the patient's perspective, but also the caregiver's perspective. And finally, integrating health and community-based care, given the focus on enhancing community-based services in the country right now. So what kind of data do we have? And this is where I want to make Jim happy. Um, we have foundational surveys that we have um, brought in um, as part of the uh, CARE initiative. In 2009, this is the very first survey, phase three, we started with a, a number of 5,000 older adults aged above 60. And we followed them in 2011, and we're following them again this year in phase three of a study, a panel on health. Um, um, well, in phase three, we actually changed the name. It's, we're trying to look at frailty specifically, uh, but a lot of the other components are, are the same. So we're building upon the panel of health and aging of Singaporean elderly. That's uh, three waves of survey data. This second survey is a new panel of 50 to 59, where we are hoping to get a sample size of about 1,000. And this is really focusing on work environment, work stress, discrimination on health outcomes. And the plan is to be able to follow up this group over time and look at their transition into retirement, if we get the funding. Um, the last survey, which is the last um, foundational survey for care is called SIGNS, and here we're looking at the population 60 and over and an estimated sample size of 5,000. And we're looking at issues um, very similar to the um, data that uh, Prof. Saito has because phase was actually modeled on the, how do you say, NULTA? NULSA study, your data? LSOA. LSOA, okay. Um, and so they have a lot of similarities across, across all three of them. So these are the foundational studies that we're going to be working from. And what kind of topics are we going to be covering um, substantively? Well, under our core theme of healthy aging, if you remember a couple slides back, um, we are going to be initiating studies on sleep, looking at the relationship between um, sleep and mortality and sleep and cognition with our neuroscience colleagues. We're interested in falls and predicting falls hotspots around the country and looking at the impact of falls on quality of life. We're interested in chronic pain and this links to healthy life expectancy um, and issues like treatable joint disease, falls and trauma and looking at our frailty and pre-frailty, as I mentioned earlier. These are all under the topic of healthy aging. Um, under retirement transitions, health and well-being, we're interested in retirement and health, uh, intergenerational transfers uh, between um, grandparents, grandchildren, um, older adults and their adult children, looking at transfer flows um, between generations will give us an idea of intergenerational solidarity and looking at that idea of a social contract um, between generations and whether that still exists in a highly urban setting like Singapore and what kind of ethnic differences can we see because there, we know that there are ethnic differences between the Chinese, Malays, and Indians in Singapore with regard to transfers. And um, use this second theme, finally, we're going to look at transitions in and out of, of health states. 
and um, social service needs segments by being able to segment individuals by their um, health and social care needs. Um, these are just two more themes that we're going to be studying over the next few years. Under the, the theme long-term care, we're looking at, it, at evaluating a program on, um, called the Aging in Place Program, which looks at people, older people who are frequent flyers, as we call them, in and out of the hospital three times in the past six months, and trying to establish a program for them using community health workers and nurses that will allow them to age in place. So um, trying to fulfill their health and social um, care needs in the community. So we want to evaluate that program and see whether it's useful. Um, given rapid population aging, we need to decrease the proportion of people that come in and out of the emergency room and our hospitals. And this is an interesting um, study that we just started talking about a couple weeks ago, and it links up with um, um, the theme about community-based health and, and social services. We, we have now a living lab, so a community um, of about 350 older adults with a, with a disability um, living in a particular part of Singapore, and we're going to use that um, action lab as a place to um, implement new interventions and then evaluate them. So it's, a, it's an interesting um, study because it's not experimental in the sense that you bring people in um, to an experimental setting, but we actually study them in vivo. So just two examples of um, research projects to give you a flavor of the kind of work that we do. Um, the first one is estimating healthy life expectancy, and this ties in very well with what Saito was mentioning earlier. Um, we have a paper um, um, together, and I'll be showing you a few of the results. So health expectancy is um, the proportion of years a person can expect to live um, without a disability. This is one way to define it. And it differs from total life expectancy, which in Singapore now is 82 years old. And um, this paper is, is in press at the moment, but what we found for Singapore is that there are very uh, significant gender differences in um, total life expectancy and inactive life expectancy. Um, both of them are higher in women, so women live longer, but they also live um, more years in ill health, in this case with an ADL um, and or an IADL. Um, and hence, active life expectancy is higher for men. Education, we found, is also strongly associated with total life expectancy and active life expectancy, similar to, to what Saito showed earlier, um, both are higher among those with higher education. So people with higher education live longer, and they live more of those years active. Um, ethnicity is associated with active life expectancy. So when you compare the three main ethnic groups in Singapore, Singapore is about 76% Chinese, 11% Malay, about 8 or 9% Indian. Um, you'll see that Chinese have the highest active life expectancy in the country compared to the minority groups. So what are, what are some of the, the um, takeaways from, from this type of work? Well, looking at um, how to optimize opportunities for health, social participation, and security for older people as they age, um, as they become inactive, and looking at the concept of an age-friendly um, city in Singapore, which is something that the government is looking into. <clears throat> the second example I, I wanted to give you is looking at long-term care service utilization and the role of caregivers. I think too often when we look at long-term care service utilization, we focus on the patient. But a lot of decision-making around the use of such services are made by families. And in the Asian context, it's often the adult child, um, the oldest son, um, or um, the daughter uh, it, who's making the, the final decision. So in this particular piece of research, we, we ask the question, what are the characteristics of users of long-term care services? Because if you remember um, in my introduction, we're, I, I don't know um, 
about other countries in the room, but in Singapore, we're a little wary about building too many nursing homes um, because we're not sure first whether it's a good thing, whether families should still be providing the care. I think families, the idea is families should. And also, how much are people going to use um, not just nursing homes, actually, but dementia daycare services, um, uh, rehabilitative services, because right now, and I'm not showing the data today, we see very low take-up rates of long-term care services. What seems to happen in Singapore is people hire a foreign domestic worker who they can have 24-7 in the household, and it, it takes away the requirement of having to drop off an older parent at an institution every day. Okay, so we wanted to know what are the characteristics of people who use long-term care services? How can we plan moving forward policy-wise? And what is the role of caregivers in, in predicting the use of long-term care services? So as I mentioned earlier, we're looking at the patterns of, of disease. We're moving away from acute conditions to more chronic degenerative um, diseases and disabilities. And so there's appears to be a worldwide effort to transition to long-term care facilities, but our question was, again, even if they're built, will people come? And we actually um, just published a, a paper on this. Um, I can give you the reference if you're interested. Um, we, we noted that long-term care use in Singapore and in other parts of Asia are lower compared to Western societies. Um, even though investments have been made, some investments have been made in long-term care services. And our Agency for Integrated Care, that's the AIC, noted that um, the take-up rate of community services was less than 50% in Singapore. So our team thought there was a very definite need to understand caregiver characteristics um, because it has been suggested in some literature that caregiver characteristics can be um, very important predictors of long-term care use. And the second um, reason for this study was that a lot of previous literature had focused on institutional-based long-term care use, at, like nursing homes. But we were interested in more community-based long-term care use, so again, rehabilitative services, dementia daycare, daycare in general, um, home therapy, and home nursing. So we were interested in the determinants of community-based long-term care. And what we found was um, care recipients' characteristics did matter very much. Um, care recipients who were younger, who had secondary or higher education, who had a Medisave account, which is essentially um, insurance in, in Singapore, um, and had a higher number of activities of daily living limitations, were more likely to use services. So the younger old were more likely to use services than those with higher education. If caregivers were female, they were more likely um, to use long-term care services. This is the, the care recipient would be more likely to use long-term care services. If there were fewer family members living with the caregiver, the recipient was more likely to use long-term care services. And if the family said there was more need of social support, the patient was more likely to use long-term care services. So looking at these characteristics, we know that um, in the years to come, caregivers will continue to be pre predominantly female, that there will be much smaller families and potentially fewer members living with the caregiver if the caregiver is an elderly spouse, for example. And so it appears, and, and more people will have um, MediSave, more people will be educated, um, that there may be an increase in the use of long-term care services over time. Um, caregivers who were older and not working were also more likely to, to be associated with care recipients who used long-term care services. These are probably retired older spouses. Um, and care recipients were, who were in smaller housing um, had high household income and a lower number of comorbidities were more likely to use um, home-based services. 
So do caregiver perceptions predict utilization of long-term care services? If so, how? And um, we think that family members and caregivers are very likely to be involved in the decision-making process because their characteristics are very predictive of long-term care use. And we think that caregiver needs, like more social, needing more social support, as well as perceptions of long-term care services may be important determinants. In looking at the data, going back to the data again, we found that family caregivers are crucial in, in determining whether or not to use long-term care services. In fact, 90% of the time, um, decisions about long-term care services were made by the caregiver alone or jointly with the care recipient. And affordability is a key concern for caregivers. Um, this is a study that we published uh, this year as well, looking at social isolation, health, and lifestyles. And it's a nice one because it blends the social science with the um, clinical. And in this case, we're looking at social science, um, social isolation, and mortality over time. So we used the panel data set, phase two. Um, I mentioned phase three earlier. And we wanted to see whether being socially isolated was related to mortality risk over a two-year time period. Um, just going very quickly through, um, there was a policy um, angle as well. Uh, Singapore is very much um, um, enamored with the notion that living together means older people will be better off. And this has been the traditional housing policy. But our data shows, and I'll get to the punchline, that it doesn't matter really who you live with. It matters more whether you, are, you perceive yourself as lonely. So we actually saw cases in which older adults were living with children, um, but extremely lonely um, using the three item UCLA loneliness scale. This is just showing you um, the increase in one person households over time in Singapore, South Korea, and Japan. And um, just to, to reiterate the point that social relationships have the same um, predictive power as smoking and obesity, for example, um, on um, poor health outcomes. So um, a high proportion of older adults living with children only are lonely. And um, uh, older adults who live with a spouse only or with children and a spouse, the presence of a spouse is very, very important, basically. So here, this is the result slide. Um, if you just focus on the top bar, this is the um, odds ratio for um, being lonely on your risk of dying over a two-year period. So you can see that um, in the first model, we just controlled for uh, loneliness. And it, it, you're about 1.1 times more likely to die in um, the two-year period. This stays the same even though you control for how many social, what your social network looks like. And um, it stays pretty much the same when you control for living arrangements. Um, some living arrangements look predictive in this case, but in our final model when we control for health, and I thought this will wipe out everything social, we still maintained um, 1.07 um, odds of dying if you're lonely over the two year period. So perceived loneliness is associated with the greater risk of dying in Singapore, and it's more predictive of mortality than living arrangements and social networks. So multi-generational housing may be valuable, but it's not sufficient. Um, I know I'm running out of time. Um, CARE has a host of education activities that we conduct as well, and coming up are numbers four, five, six, and seven. Um, we have a seminar on uh, longevity, live, learn, and work. And um, we are running uh, research methods workshops regularly. We'll be having conferences at least once a year. Um, this is my last slide. Um, what would we like to do um, over time? I'll just focus on um, um, the engagement with partners locally and internationally, which is why I think this meeting is hugely important. Um, um, to engage in, in potentially high-impact translational type of research, um, and then build a repository of data on aging. So at CARE, we're actually going to start um, working on and thinking about a data repository for those foundational surveys that I showed you, 
and then build up from there. Thank you very much.